Hey guys, this lesson is for Calculus BC. It's from the chapter called Series, and this is 9.1, and this is on sequences. So a sequence, think about it in everyday life, a sequence is just um, a series of things happening in order. So it's a function in math representing a list of integers following a specific pattern. All right, in each of these terms within the pattern, all right, in a sequence can be represented by a subscript notation. And all I mean by subscript is just, so a sub one, a sub two, a sub three. Those are subscripts, okay? So here's a sub n. A sub n is gonna denote the entire sequence. I'll use that, look at this example down here to represent the entire um, function, but it'll also represent what that last term, what's called the nth term could be. Okay, so if I'm talking about a sequence of, of whole numbers, just going one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to the nth number that I want to go up to, meaning like the tenth number, the 500th number, this would be a sub one, meaning the first term, a sub two, the second term, a sub three. And again, that's one, two, and three, not because these are one, two, and three, it's because it's the first, second, third, and fourth term in this sequence, okay? So let's look at this first example. This first one reads a sub n equals 3 plus negative 1 raised to n. So I want the first four terms. So I'm going to say a sub 1 is going to be 3 plus negative 1 raised to that number that I put in there, the first power. a sub 2, 3 plus negative 1 to the second power. a sub 3 is going to be 3 plus negative 1 to the third power. And then a sub 4 is going to be 3 plus negative 1 to the fourth power. So again, whichever term I'm plugging in, that's what I'm putting in a spot of n, okay? So now you're just going to solve each of these, and those four numbers will be the first four numbers in the sequence. So remember, whenever I have a negative number raised to an odd number, it stays negative. When I have it raised to an even, it becomes positive, all right? So if I have... Um, negative 1 to the first, it stays negative 1. So both of these, and also negative 1 raised to 3 is negative 1. So it would be 3 minus 1, which gives me 2. And then negative 1 raised to an even power is going to give me a positive 1. So I have 3 plus 1 on these, and these will be 4. Okay? So the pattern for this sequence is going to be 2, comma, 4, comma, 2, comma, 4. And then it would continue on, okay? Let's take a look at this next one over here. So instead of a sub n, it's b sub n. That's just like in algebra when you had um, f of x or g of x, just a different variable, okay? So again, first four terms. So b sub 1 is going to be 1 over 1 minus 2 times 1. b sub 2 is going to be... 2 over 1 minus 2 times 2. Again, just plugging that number in where you see the ends. b sub 3. And b sub 4. All right, now we're just going to solve each of those. So this is... 1 minus 2, negative 1, so this is going to give me a negative 1 over 1. 2 times 2 is 4, 1 minus 4, this is going to give me a negative 2 over 3. 2 times 3 is 6, 1 minus 6 is a negative 5, so I have negative 3 over 5. And then I have 2 times 4, which is 8, 1 minus 8 would be a negative 7, so negative 4 over 7. And those are my first four terms. I'll just write them as a sequence. And remember, this is just the first four of a sequence that does continue much longer. And that's why we include those little dots there. This next style of question is called a recursion formula. And that's just because you're going to bring about and repeat the previous answer. So um, whenever you see this notation here of d sub n plus 1, it could be 
a sub n plus one also and any letter could be here but this n plus one in the subscript means that this is going to represent the following term right the plus one means the upcoming term when this happens they have to give you whatever the previous term was so for example if they want the first four terms they're already giving you the first one here they're telling you that d sub one is 25. so now if i go up to the next term it means plus one meaning the upcoming one right that would be d sub two I'm going to use what d sub n was, the previous one, which in this case was 25, right? I'm going to bring that down and say 25 minus 5. And that's going to give me 20. So for the next one, d sub 3, I'm going to use my previous answer and plug that right here into this part of the equation. And then we want four terms, so we're going to go one more. We're going to get that previous answer and plug it into the equation. All right? And so the first four terms would be 25, then 20, then 15, and then 10. And again, we include these dots because remember the terms do go on into an infinite amount of terms. We are just listing the first four. All right, so one more time, recursion formula. You're putting the previous answer in for that D sub N, okay? So I mentioned to you that we put these dots because these, um, these terms in the sequence could go on forever into infinity, okay? So that's where this next concept is going to come into play the limit of a sequence, okay? Remember we use limits to understand things approaching. So we could say that n, which represents, if we look back here, as n approaches infinity, meaning as this n keeps getting higher and higher, meaning a higher term and a higher term, of a sequence is going to give us some number l, right? So they're telling you if that number l exists, meaning it's an actual number, the vocabulary word that we're going to learn here is that we call that sequence that that sequence converges to a number. If that number L that comes out does not exist, meaning you get a D and E or an infinity, then we say that that sequence diverges. Two very important vocabulary words, converges and diverges, that you're going to use throughout this entire chapter. So, really quick, easy go-to. If you get an answer, a numerical answer, you can say it converges. If you get does not exist or infinity, you can say that it diverges, okay? Let's look at these next two examples. Here's a sequence of a sub n, and it's 1 over 2 to the nth power. When I start looking at the pattern of what that sequence looks like, I get 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 over 8, and as I keep going, notice that my denominator keeps growing, 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 and my numerator stays at one. That means if I continue this pattern and it grows and I keep going to an infinite amount of terms, I'll end up with a huge number in the denominator approaching a bigger, bigger number. I'll approach infinity in the denominator. We learned in limits that a number over infinity is zero. Since I get an actual number zero, we can say that that converges at zero. Let's look at this one, b sub n is 2 to the nth power. So the pattern, the sequence, goes 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and this will keep getting bigger, 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 bigger until it reaches infinity. Since this ends up going to infinity, we can say that this diverges. Okay? So, back in AB, I had you memorize these first two limits, okay? And for this first one, I even gave you um, several different versions of rewriting it. You can look back at that on the limits videos. We are throwing in a third one here, okay? Which is the limit as x approaches infinity of one plus one over x raised to x, okay? And now, here in this first one, we said the answer was always gonna be the coefficients. Here, the answer is always zero. Here, my answer is always going to be e, okay? And the reason for that, if you try and do it by hand, um, you will end up getting stuck.
But if you look at the graph, there is an asymptote at E. This function approaches E. So if I want to see as I go to infinity, I will approach that asymptote. So this is just a quick one to memorize. Anytime you spot this, your answer is E. So I have a little something to remind you of from the algebra before we see this next sequence, okay? And that's a factorial, okay? A lot of you probably remember it as the exclamation point, but a factorial is when you have an exclamation point after a number. And all that means is you're going to multiply every number leading up to that one, okay? So for example, if I say 3 factorial, I'm just multiplying every number up to 3. 1 times 2 times 3, which gives me 6, okay? 1 to have memorized, um, I won't bore you with the theorem, is 0 factorial equals 1. Make sure to have that memorized, okay? So if I look at this next one, it says show that the sequence converges and find its limit, okay? So let's start off by just looking at what the pattern looks like if I check the first few. So if I say c sub 1, I get negative 1 to the first power times 1 over 1 factorial, okay? This is going to be a negative, and 1 over 1 factorial is going to be 1. C sub 2, negative 1 to the second power, it's going to make it positive, and then 1 over 2 factorial, 2 times 1 is just 2. So positive 1 half. C sub 3, I'm going to get negative 1 to the third power times 1 over 3 factorial. This would be a negative. 3 factorial would be 3 times 2 times 1, which we said is 6. And let's check one more. C sub 4, I have negative 1 to the 4th power, making this positive, times 1 over 4 factorial. That's 4 times 3 times 2, which gives me 24, okay? So, if I look at this on a number line, just so you kind of get a visual, okay? My first number was negative 1. Let's say this is positive 1 here, just for argument's sake. So, if first I was at negative 1, then I was at positive half, then I was at negative 1 over 6, then I was at positive 1 over 24. Notice that I am bouncing back and forth between the positive and negative numbers, but I am getting closer and closer. You can imagine if this keeps getting bigger and bigger, right? Like we saw with the limit, the limit as n approaches infinity for c sub n. So as the n's keep getting closer and closer to infinity, my denominators are going to get way bigger, and this is just going to keep bouncing back and forth between positive and negative. So keep bouncing back and forth, back and forth, but as my denominators get bigger, my number gets smaller, and I'll get closer and closer to zero. Okay? So I can say, I analyze my sequence, I found that it converges at zero, and I used the limit to state it. So this is a really nice way, especially if you're taking the AP test on a free response question, to answer it, right? I showed my work, I showed, I even showed a visual here, the limit of C of N goes to zero, and it converges at zero, all right? All right, so another quick um, theorem these are nice things to jot down maybe on a separate sheet of paper that you could always refer back to. And that's the absolute value theorem. So actually, let's leave this here so you can see. Um, if you can come to the conclusion that it'll converge to zero if I analyze the absolute value, meaning don't pay attention to the signs. So if I ignore this negative one raised to n, which is what will always alternate your signs, if I can state that this 1 over n factorial is going to converge to 0, then without the absolute value, meaning taking into account the sign change, I could also state that it's going to converge to 0. So whenever you see this alternating right, right here, anytime you see this, this means that your sequence is going to alternate signs. Whenever you see that, you can ignore it for a second, analyze what's happening here. If you can prove that that converges to zero, then you can say that the whole thing does. Now, that's only allowed if it converges to zero. Don't use that rule for divergence or converging to some other number, okay? All right, so now we're going to talk about coming up with the nth term. In these past few questions, 
They've given you the nth term. Now we're going to do the opposite. This question reads, find a sequence whose first five terms are given and determine if it converges or diverges. So whenever you see um, a sequence and the terms have fractions, I'm going to encourage you to look at the numerator and the denominator individually. So first, just analyzing the numerator, okay? We can say that that numerator, um, at first it looks like it's just even numbers, two, four, maybe if there was a six, eight, then it could have been even numbers. Um, but if I still see kind of that even pattern, I might want to check um, exponents next, like 2 to the first, 2 to the second. Let's see if that one works. 2 to the first power is 2, 2 to the second is 4, 2 to the third is 8, 2 to the fourth is 16, and so on. So we're catching that this is 2 raised to, if it was the first, second, third, fourth, that is being represented by the term. So if n represents the term, first term, second, third, and so on, we can write 2 raised to the n. Right, and that's how we represent powers of 2. Okay, now let's check out the denominator. I have 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. This is odd numbers, okay? Now, the way we represent odd numbers, um, it'd be really easy to represent an even number. We'd say 2 times that number. So if the first term, you know, was even, then we'd say 2 times the first term, 2 times the second. But if it's odd, we want to subtract one from that, okay? So instead of landing with 2, 4, 6, 8, we want to subtract one number and end up with 1, 3, 5, 7. So 2 times n, giving us even numbers, and then subtracting one to get to the odd numbers. And I know you're probably thinking, how did she come up with that? But um, the more you see these, you're going to start to know that these are things you're going to memorize and you're going to be able to catch them a lot faster, okay? So if I want to write what this sequence is, I'm going to write a sub n is 2 to the nth power over 2 times n minus 1, okay? So, so far I found the nth term, okay? I found my sequence. Now it says determine if this converges or diverges. Well, we know we can do that with the limit to infinity. So I can say the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, right? It's going to give me 2 raised to the infinity over 2 times infinity minus 1. Now here, if you've gotten good at your limits in the past from a, b, you know that exponential functions grow faster. So if the exponential functions in the numerator, this is a top-heavy fraction. And we know that top-heavy fractions equal infinity. And we know that when these equal infinity, we can say that this diverges. Okay? So... Um, I want to show you a list of these to kind of memorize to help you come up with this. Let's take a look at them over here. Common nth terms that you'll see, we've seen these three already, is that negative 1 to the nth power means that your um, terms in the sequence are going to be alternating signs, okay? And then 2 times n is going to represent even numbers, and 2 times n minus 1 is going to represent odd numbers. So the next vocabulary word I want you to see is the word monotonic, okay? Um, another one to memorize, and all it means is that the sequence will either always be increasing or always be decreasing, okay? So let's take a look at this first one. This is one that we saw earlier on in this section. We know that a sub 1 was 3 plus negative 1 to the first, a sub 2 was 3 plus negative 1 to the second. a sub 3 was 3 plus negative 1 to the third. And a sub 4 was 3 plus negative 1 to the fourth. And we know that this gave me uh, 2, and then 4, and then 2, and then 4. Okay? So the fact that this goes Bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. You could even see it on a graph, right? If this is one, two, three, four. This went 
two and then four and then two and then four you can see that it is not always increasing or decreasing it changes so this would be considered not monotonic okay let's take a look at the next one okay we've also seen this one we have B sub 1 would be 2 times 1, which is 2, over 1 plus 1, which is 2. B sub 2 is going to be 2 times 2, which is 4, over 1 plus 2, which is 3. So here's my first term, my second. Now we're going to go B sub 3. We have 2 times 3, which is 6, over 1 plus 3, which is 4. You don't really have to worry about reducing. You could, but you can still analyze it either way. Beats of 4 is going to be 2 times 4, which is 8, over 1 plus 4, which is 5. All right, so when we analyze this, um, we're noticing that our numerators are getting bigger and so are our denominators. That means that this number in its entirety, you could even analyze it in its decimals if you'd like, is increasing, okay? Since this is increasing, we can say, therefore, it is monotonic. All right? Let's look at one more. So for this one, C sub one, I get one squared over two to the first power minus one. And this gives me one over two to the first minus one. This gives me one. Now we have two to the second over two squared minus one. And this is gonna give me four over three. So I went from one to four over three is something greater than one. And it's um, approximately 1.3, okay? Sometimes it's easier to see them as a decimal. Here we have three squared, which is nine over now I have two to the third minus one, which that's gonna give me seven. If I analyze that as a decimal, it's about 1.28. So I can stop here because from one, I went greater to 1.3 and then I went smaller to 1.28. So because this went increase and then decrease, this is not monotonic, all right? So just another way to analyze these sequences. Now we're gonna talk about how these sequences at times could be bounded by a number, okay? So um, a sequence is bounded above if the sequence gives you numbers that are less than or equal to that number, let's call it M, okay? And then if the sequence is smaller, then M is the upper bound, right? If a sequence is bounded below, that's if all of the numbers in the sequence are greater than or equal to that number that it is bounded by. And that would be then a lower boundary, okay? A sequence will be completely bounded if it's bounded above and below. So if it has both scenarios, we just call it completely bounded instead of above or below, okay? If a sequence is bounded and monotonic, we can conclude right away that it converges, okay? So, a lot of fancy writing. Let's look at an example. I think it's gonna make this make a lot more sense, okay? Find the least upper bound. If I start analyzing this equation, before I even start testing out numbers, I know that my denominator, if I have n over n plus one, this denominator is always gonna be one more than the numerator. So my sequence would look, let's say if I start at one, okay, I would have one over one plus one, which is two. And then if I do the second one, I'll have two over two plus one, which is three. 
and then 3 over 3 plus 1, which is 4. You see how my denominator is always 1 more than my numerator? So if I keep analyzing this, let's say even the 20th term, I'll have 20 over 1 more, which is 21. And if I keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going on and on and on, let's say even to 1,000, right? I'll have 1,000 over 1,001. So if I analyze all of these fractions, right? And obviously this keeps going on and on and on. I can tell that one half, no big deal, but this is really close to being equal to one because if I had 21 over 21, that would equal one. If I had 1,000 over 1,000, that would equal one. So all of these numbers, although smaller than one, get really, really close to one. But because the denominator will always be one more, it will never reach one, okay? That is why this scenario, this series, is bounded above by one, okay? So we can say that a sub n is bounded above by one, okay? For these last set of questions, we're just gonna analyze them overall. The question says, identify if the sequence is bounded, is monotonic, is convergent or divergent. So we're just kinda gonna look at the entire sequence. Look at this first one, one over n. If we start looking at the terms, first term would be one over one, second term would be one over two, then one over three, one over four, we keep going, like for example, the 10th term would be one over 10 and so on. When you get to the infinite term, it would be one over infinity, okay? So we know that one over infinity is a bottom heavy, okay? And because it's bottom heavy, this actually equals zero, okay? So we can see that the sequence starts at the number one, and then starts getting to a smaller number, half, a third, a fourth, so on, and it starts getting smaller, decreases, right, all the way until the number zero, okay? So there's a few things we can say about this. The fact that it's always decreasing, we can say that it is monotonic. The fact that the highest number it, go, it ever is, I'm sorry, is one, and the lowest number it is, is zero, we can say it has an upper bound of one and a lower bound of zero, meaning that it is bounded above by one, bounded below by zero, which means it is completely bounded. Now, because it's monotonic, it's bounded, right? It's always decreasing. We know that this, we even see it here. There's several different ways we're seeing the same answer, is that this converges. All right, so again, we're just analyzing the sequences. Let's go ahead and look at this next one, okay? My first term would be one squared, which is one, over one plus one, which is two. Then we have two squared, which is four, over two plus one, which is three. Then we have three squared, which is nine, over three plus one, which is four. And as we keep analyzing this onto infinity, we have infinity squared over infinity plus one. And again, we remember from limits that if um, exponential functions have more weight, and if it's in the top, that makes this top heavy, which makes this infinity. The fact that it goes to infinity, we know that this is going to diverge. Okay? So now, this one, we see a lower bound of one half, right? And then my fraction just keeps getting bigger, 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 all the way up until infinity. 
Okay, let's look at this last one. Negative one raised to the n. If we remember the different nth terms that we want to memorize, that negative one raised to the nth power means that it is alternating. Okay, which means that when I put n is one, I'm just going to get negative one and then positive one and then negative one and then positive one and so on. That'll continue forever. So if this is constantly going between positive and negative one, we can say that this is bounded completely lower by negative one and above by positive one. So we could say bounded by positive and negative one. Now, because this keeps bouncing up and down, up and down between positive and negative one, this is not monotonic. You may even remember the word from limits, oscillates, right? Oscillates means that a function bounces up and down uncontrollably. So this is bouncing between negative one and positive one, negative one, positive one, and it'll do that forever. So we, because it oscillates, if you remember back in limits, anytime it oscillates, the limit does not exist, right? That was one of our three main rules when the limit does not exist. Therefore, if it does not exist, we can say that it diverges. And there you go, that is 9.1.